uh, very much to the family of uh, SESDA data archives uh, who have uh, been stimulating proper and adequate uh, archiving for decades. Uh, I, when I started out in this business in the, in the late 60s, um, I already at that time uh, was subject to uh, stimuli from data archives to take uh, these matters seriously. Um, so most of the data are uh, discoverable, are accessible, are interoperable, are reusable, etc. And that is daily practice. Um, good. Most of the publications of all these data, and I, as you imagine, if there are many data, there are many publications, um, are covered by well-established sources of, uh, of, of, of metadata information. They're well described. Uh, and there are many of these sources, uh, like Crossref and, 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 and many others, uh, which apply uh, uh, a, a, a form of uh, making available not only metadata, but also making available uh, the, the awareness uh, and the description of the field as a whole in terms of its publications. Moreover, existing search tools or discovery tools, such as existing in Web of Science or even Scholar Google, allow dedicated searches uh, or discoveries by formulating search strings with or without Boolean operators uh, in such a way that one can really fine tune what it is that one looks for. So what is there still left to desire? Well, uh, there are a number of challenges uh, left and one of the most important ones has to do with uh, searching or discovering links between, on the one hand, data sources and on the other hand, publications. Um, which parts of publications relate or have been based upon which data sources? That's very difficult to find out without a lot of perseverance, without a lot of manual work. Uh, and uh, sometimes even then you have to go way beyond uh, normal things. You have to read everything before you can make a kind of detective-like uh, decision that this is probably based on those data. And that absence of making that link clear hampers the further development, particularly at, at meta-theoretical level of the field. And that meta-theoretical level is increasingly important because all the individual studies, of course, yield their publications and their insights but at a comparative level across countries, across time, across time within countries, across time, across countries, and all of that, we want to come to a kind of meta-theoretical level of insight. And for that, you need to be able to identify these links between data and publications. And so that is uh, something that uh, is still to be desired. And the approach uh, in trying to uh, address this problem was by developing something which is called a knowledge graph. Uh, and a knowledge graph is a tool in which information from uh, different sources is combined uh, and connected. Uh, and in that way, you could say it breaks down silos or it connects silos. Um, and the, the, the aim of a knowledge graph for a research community uh, is to provide more tailored uh, and more detailed information about these connections than general search tools uh, could provide. Um, so what has come out of this, this uh, template? Well, first of all, the pilot knowledge graph that we developed is indeed uh, able to provide queries, uh, provide answers to queries of a kind that cannot be addressed with normal and other available search tools. So that, that's one thing. So we can demonstrate that the development of a knowledge graph for a field like electoral studies, and therefore also for similar kinds of fields, uh, is uh, in principle a, a feasible and viable way forward. Um, yet there are also a number of limitations. Uh, that we encountered and to some extent we encountered them because we were probably 
oh no, certainly, uh, a little bit naive uh, about uh, a number of assumptions about what was and what was not available in, in various ways. Um, and this particularly having to do with the quality of metadata. Uh, I'll elaborate uh, on that in, in a moment, but quality of metadata is by far not what it, what it and, and, and its providers boast it to be. Um, and that uh, provides serious challenges in and of itself. But so the problem that we encountered in task 9.3 is a different kind of problem that was encountered in task 9.2 and therefore also the solution is a different solution. Task 9.4 and we have, uh, for, for those of you who were here yesterday afternoon at uh, the last session, uh, you've seen uh, or, or heard uh, the presentation from Carmen Di Meo, uh, who uh, talked about the development of the Restore and IOLI uh, platforms. Um, uh, this is a field of, of researchers in heritage science, um, which uh, is uh, characterized by, on the one hand, um, having a variety of sources which are sometimes describing the same physical or material objects, um, but at the same time a field and a research community that is characterized by a variety of disciplinary backgrounds. They're not all historians, they're not all uh, uh, material scientists, they are from different uh, disciplinary back backgrounds. And some of the problems that they encounter are yet a little bit different. Uh, to some extent, technical problems, uh, as Carmen called it, uh, incompatible but locked in data formats. Uh, so different uh, providers of, of relevant information being locked into their established ways of doing things which are not compatible with each other. Um, so that's a technical problem of overcoming that. Um, a lack of semantic interoperability, uh, which has its roots in uh, different disciplinary backgrounds. And so their approach was to some extent transforming existing data to a common standard and common formats to overcome the technical uh, heterogeneity uh, that existed in the field and to develop uh, new ontologies and controlled vocabularies allowing uh, in that way, a uh, more uh, straightforward uh, and uh, unequivocal exchange of information uh, between groups with different disciplinary backgrounds. So, uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that this has to be uh, limited, but the three groups encountered three different problems, uh, uh, sets of problems, and therefore chose four different solutions. And I think that's what we should keep in mind. Real research groups, real data communities or research communities all encounter relatively unique sets of problems. Not that they're not overlapping, of course there are overlaps in that, um, but the particular set of uh, challenges that they encounter are unique for each uh, research community and therefore have to be addressed in terms of what suits that uh, user community and it's not necessarily one solution that fits all. And so the silos metaphor suggests a little bit too much to my taste uh, that there is one kind of a problem uh, and that there is therefore one kind of solution um, that uh, is not the case. If we look at the EMM, the uh, Immigration Minority, uh, uh, the, the ethnic, and min ethnic Minority and Migration, uh, sorry, I'm mixing up my words here, uh, uh, situation is not one where different silos were existing in isolation, unless, unless we would consider researchers who kept their data on their own computer as separate silos, but I don't think normally we would do it that way. It's actually the problem of the absence of a silo, of a well-constructed, sustainable silo of specialized knowledge and integrated data. So that's the problem. 
for electoral studies, the silos metaphor might have been most useful because we have these two domains uh, of information data on the one hand uh, and uh, covered by data archives, publications covered by uh, metadata providers about uh, publication on the other hand and those were not compatible and we tried to find a solution for that. Heritage science to some extent yet other problems, technical problems and problems of uh, different disciplinary backgrounds which had to be addressed not so much by silos but by developing ontologies and, and, and controlled vocabularies which allowed uh, the different participants to productively engage with one another. Um, so the silos metaphor to some extent I think suggests too much uniformity and it easily masks a quite wide variety, which is not exhaustively described here, uh, of actual problems. So some of the problems have to do with substandard practice in research communities and, and by individual researchers. Not archiving your data is substandard practice. Um, not doing proper data citation is substandard practice and so on. Uh, that's nothing to do with silos and we shouldn't overlook that this is an important problem. A second kind of problem is that the schemes in which metadata are defined do often not fit the needs of a particular research community. They are very useful. I'm not going to say anything negative about them, but they are not solutions for each and every problem under the sun. So within research communities, their needs require a finer level of granularity than at a higher level. And most of these metadata schemes have been developed for higher level. They're very useful to distinguish contributions in economics from those in political science or those in geography, etc. Yes, but now within political science and then within electoral studies, they don't help us anymore. They only tell us this is about electoral studies. Oh yes, but we knew that already. And now further, it doesn't help us. So metadata schemes often do not fit uh, the particular needs of research communities. Sometimes research communities do something about this. Uh, not all of them have done so far. Um, but for instance, in economics, uh, when you publish an article, you are being, by almost all journals in economics, uh, requested to fill in a little scheme of about 100 categories where your article fits. And that is indeed developed for use within uh, the user communities uh, of, of, of economics. That is something that still needs to be developed in, in many other fields. And of course, in, in the EMM field, with the development of uh, the new metadata scheme that you, imply, uh, that you apply there, you are on your way in doing so. Uh, next question is whether we can make in the publication domain uh, these things stick. Another problem has to do with poor, sorry, uh, right, with poor coverage of metadata. I said at the beginning metadata providers make us believe that what they provide is really there to some extent is make-believe. Sorry to say so. Crossref is one of these providers that boasts that in uh, contrast to some other uh, metadata providers, they include the abstracts of articles. Well, that's useful because once you have abstracts, the full text of an abstract, you can use all kinds of tools uh, in order to extract information for that and populate your metadata. However, they do so only for about 20% of the articles that they describe. The other 80% they don't. In other metadata fields, it's on average about 50% missing. Uh, so we were a little bit naive in, at first instance, taking at face value the claims of metadata providers. But this is a big problem that we will encounter and that will, to some extent, not make solutions like a knowledge graph 
unfeasible, but make them less powerful than they otherwise would be. There are real problems in terms of technical incompatibilities for, uh, be because of locked-in technical standards from ranging from operating system, outdated software, and what have you. So these are really problems that are there, that are troubling research communities, and that are masked by this silos metaphor. And there's something else. So I call this in defense of silos. I think the whole notion of, the, that, of that silos have to be overcome uh, or have to be broken down is wrong. First of all, if you want to connect silos or overcome silos, they have to be there in the first place. And if they're not, and this is not just a simple uh, uh, kind of funny truism, if they're not there, in an institutionalized, sustainable, and well set up way, we are unable, even within research communities, to do our work properly. And I think what has been done in the EMM domain, particularly, tell what has been done there is to make a data silo. And by doing so, they, they, they help develop that research community. And then, once it's there, we have the ability to connect it to other ones. Without it being there, there's nothing to connect. So silos represent specialization. And specialization is necessary in order to make progress. It's not just a matter of knowing a little bit about everything. And uh, we also need, and I don't say as a contrast, but we also need specialized knowledge. And the more specialized that knowledge is, the higher the added value will be of connecting that silo of specialized knowledge to other silos. The less it is developed, the less that connection will yield. So, also if we think about it this way, silo transcending research, and I think transcending is better than breaking them down or something like that, silo transcending research if we look at the history of science and the history of specializations that develop over time, silo transcending research yields new silos, which are broader, slightly differently defined, until at a certain moment they become, with their internal dynamic, too sterile and prompt, almost by necessity, reach out and connection with others. So, rather than specialized knowledge and breaking down silences being in a kind of antithetical relationship, it's either the one or the other, my proposition would be that they need each other and that the relationship between the two is of an intricate and dialectical nature rather than that we have to only emphasize one. And so, therefore, in defense of silos, because only with silos we can connect them and can get benefit from that. And that is what this picture is. If we look at that atomium and we take the balls or the spheres as the silos, they are connected, they're not broken down. If they were broken down, it was, would be one big heap of rubble. Huh? They're connected. But to be connected, they have to be there in the first place and well-structured and with good content. And so we need both. We need to look at real research communities and what they actually do, and we need to look at ways to connect them, but not the one at the expense of the other or at the exclusion of the other. Thank you. Here we go with the, the title of uh, this morning's uh, session, Breaking Down Silos. Uh, maybe we should have called them Strengthening Silos. Uh, next speaker will be Ivana, and she will talk about uh, collaboration and, and the memorandum of understanding. Ivana.
Hi, everyone. Morning. <clears throat> it's so hard to be after certain speakers. Case included, and Edward is in the same group. Um, so I'm not going to try to, to say anything very profound or detailed. I'm, I'm going to stick to concrete stuff and actually serve as introduction to, to Francisca. So this is actually how we do the connections and how we move on uh, from this point on. It is slow. Okay. So this is the memorandum, not infamous yet at least. Um, it's actually a very, very desired uh, way to, to, move, to move from this point on. Um, and it has also been done over other domains and other clusters. So we are all moving into the same uh, direction. Um, as you already know, it exists and uh, um, it's been in process in a way uh, of uh, signing with the founding members, which are SSH landmarks. So what it in a nutshell does, um, it binds together, um, as you can see, landmarks, projects, and all other important stakeholders gathered in the shock project. Um, and everyone in, in, in truth who want to uh, preserve the shocks, um, numerous outputs and make them sustainable uh, and exploitable. And this is, this is the, way, the way forward. So um, what do we want to do with it? Um, in the very center, you will find maybe the main objective, which is twofold in its nature. It's about the internal connections, strengthening them, building on synergies, uh, learning from each other, um, transferring know-how, um, support each other, and, and following common interests. Um, another one is having an active role in representing our community um, to the outside um, stakeholders and, and, and partners um, in ERA and, and beyond. But then around it, we have more specific goals that are interconnected with, with the main one. So you can find eight of them, uh, could be more. Uh, we gave sort of space for that saying, and anything else of interest, of course. So um, it is supporting and maximize support to the, to the um, incoming um, research communities. Um, identify common challenges, um, and we have a lot, as, as, as we could see, both internal and, and external. Uh, visibility, branding, we actually have a very nice branding for, for SSH Open Cluster in place, but what we have to do is actually make it very, very visible and recognizable uh, to the outside world. Um, speaking with one voice um, to um, the EC, S3, uh, or important stakeholders, yesterday was a policy session, you will hear a bit about that, um, and I could say, and, and Francisca will follow up, I'm sure, that it was a unified voice, even in collaboration, even in, in um, company of other clusters, it was very, very unified, and it was recognized as such, which is a big, big victory. Um, then um, advocate, um, of course, in line with everything I said, uh, to the interest of the SSH research community, uh, be a single point of contact to everybody from the outside. Um, foster impact, there is a lot that we can build on from shock, uh, but there is more to, to be done, as I said. And, and finally, be coordinated, which is probably the challenge that uh, we have started with, did quite a lot in the past 40 months, uh, but again, there is more to be done. The foundations are here, community is here, we are talking to each other, which is, which is the biggest, the biggest victory of all. But it has to continue in a structured way. So from those goals, um, there is a number of activities already mentioned in the, in the MOU. Um, governance framework that still needs to be uh, defined in detail. Again, Francisca will follow up on that in, 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 a, in a more systematic way. Coordinating activities of interest that actually follow up from the common challenges. Um, New opportunities in terms of collaboration, and uh, when we say that, we usually all think about the EU-funded projects, which is sort of the easiest way, but there are also other ways uh, to form a bilateral, trilateral, or whatever combination of collaborations that we can, because I think um, the biggest advantage now is that we know institutions, we know our partners, we know their expertise, we know their challenges, we know their issues, we know their know-how, we know the whole spectrum of what they are and what they do. So it's very, very easy actually to reach out and say, okay, let's do this together. Um, 
then strategic goals, interests, there were quite a lot of uh, talking and discussion yesterday about um, the strategy of the whole community. So community moves on into the one direction, which is the, one of the challenges ahead, of course, for all of us. Training, outreach activities, again, branding and visibility, um, contribution to ESC. This is like one of the ultimate goals that, that we are all trying to do, but not the only one and not the most important one, I would say. And of course, try to, try to uh, sustain uh, all the key exploitable results identified in shock. So how does it work? Um, you heard and you, you learned yesterday that MOU is not legally binding, which is true. So it is the umbrella agreement. It is a framework um, and it represents more than anything else, a goodwill, a strong intention to do something together. That's the memorandum of understanding. We understand each other in terms that we want same things. Um, but it also gives space for very specific and legally binding agreements that can be formed between certain combinations of partners within this, within this consortium, within this community, on specific topics, on specific exploitable results, for example, on the marketplace. So we have sort of a space, a platform that we are all in or all, all on, on it. And then we can form small partnerships around the specific topic and they would be legally binding. So once we enter the MOU, that's what we have. We have opportunity to actually be more connected um, on, 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 on certain activities, so on. Um, this is the first year uh, SSH landmarks. Uh, Rory is missing, he signed it yesterday. So we, we didn't have time to actually include him um, uh, in, in the picture, but all SSH landmarks actually signed the MOU. So the founding members have signed it and you are all invited to join the MOU from this moment on. You have it, it's been shared on Basecamp, we can share it again. Um, and uh, please join, you have to sign. So that's the intro to, to Francisca. Uh, for any other details or questions, I'm happy to answer afterwards. Thanks. Uh, maybe can I have my laptop? Because I can also see this light. Um, good morning. Thanks, uh, Ivana, for uh, introducing the topic. Um, actually, uh, we could have started with my talk and then you would show uh, the, the highlight of the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding. But on the other hand, you're right, the Memorandum of Understanding is just an intention. It's not, it's not the full story. Um, so I'd like to go back to what Ivana mentioned yesterday, namely that uh, the point where we are now, this event, the booklet with the legacy, um, the, the program of this conference with all the uh, shockingly good and sustainable uh, results of the project, um, it all shows how much we have gained in the past uh, four years or maybe a bit more even than the past four years. So if, we, if you take the starting point, uh, namely the, uh, the the creation of the project proposal for shock. Um, it's unimaginable that we return to the point um, at which we were at that moment in time. There has been a, a, a big transition apart from all the results. And I would like to, um, sorry, I would like to, uh, this one, green. Yeah, I would like to um, dive a bit deeper in, into the transition from being the project shock, so being the project SSH Open Cloud to what we uh, will be uh, as of the signing of the MOU uh, and the end of the project, namely uh, the SSH um, Open Cluster. 
So, um, we, we, we started to uh, cluster our activities. Uh, the, the, the partners involved in shock started to, to cluster their activities and, and started to work on, on common issues in uh, a project. Generalistly funded, which helped a lot. Definitely, uh, um, th there was a good insight at, uh, at the commission when they launched the, uh, that cluster call. Um, but now we are a cluster. We are a thematic cluster. We are a cluster working on the common agenda of the SSH uh, research infrastructures. Um, we worked on a lot of project uh, outcomes. We worked towards the outcomes. But from now on, we will have to work on sustaining uh, the results, um, working towards um, a good model for all those uh, for the long list of key exploitable results, um, the individual components that, uh, that resulted from the project, but of course also the cohesion in the community and um, the, uh, the outreach to uh, even wider, uh, wider community and the training and education of the next generation. Um, we were working on new functionality, but as I just said, uh, um, the uptake of all that still needs to be stimulated and worked on. We started with some cross-disciplinary pilots, um, but from now on we will have to work on, on, on structural collaboration with uh, other research infrastructure clusters based on, on a joint, uh, on, on joint agendas, even thematic across clusters. And maybe also very important to, uh, to notice, we, we, we started with cherishing our individual uh, research infrastructure identity and, and we protected, we were inclined to protect our roots. Um, not just talking about the five uh, landmarks and areas, but also the individual nodes that were involved. But as of uh, already a while, uh, we've started to work on a joint identity and on preparing uh, an SSA-wide um, agenda for research infrastructural development. And this is all behind this MOU. If you want to do this, if you want to continue the, uh, um, um, the intentions and, and the actions and the activities here in Orange, you need a model to keep things together and to, and to strengthen um, the, uh, the potential for, for, for impact and for a lasting future. Um, and therefore you need formal framework, um, but it's maybe also good to spend a li little bit more time on, on the importance of, of that common voice. Um, because apart from what we are doing in our, in our disciplinary context, uh, um, serving the needs of our uh, fellow uh, SSH researchers, uh, um, uh, making sure that uh, there are good silos and, and good um, uh, uh, models of collaboration, we also have a role to play towards um, our stakeholders uh, and especially the, the policy makers at uh, the European Commission um, and as said yesterday uh, and underlined by uh, our project officer uh, <coughs> Bala Kolova, um, we need to make sure that not only researchers know what, what the potential for impact is of, uh, uh, of our cluster, but also uh, that policy makers will understand what kind of results can be found in, in our service offer, uh, what, what kind of uh, policy developments can be supported by the insights uh, that, that, uh, that are um, present there and, and, and that could be developed based on the data and, and tools. Um, so we need to, we, we have already magnified our voice uh, at the highest level of European policy making, but we need to continue that. Um, and uh, yeah, we, the, the other uh, important um, um, how to say that, um, uh, element in, in the ecosystem is of course the European Open Science Cloud and the collaboration 
um, the model for collaboration that it is uh, uh, that's being developed there, or that, it, that it's getting shaped there. And this is especially um, a kind of endeavor in which we really need the collaboration with the other clusters, um, the, so the thematic clusters in the landscape of research infrastructure. And so there, are um, uh, this one. Do I need to, do I need to point? Uh, no. This one. Um, this is a slide that I uh, was inspired by. Uh, it's reused by uh, of a slide by Shelley Chambers. Uh, th that image is uh, thinking. I think also part of the booklet. But it's the. Um, it, it's, it's showing again that there are right now five uh, thematic clusters in the uh, research infrastructure landscape, and um, within their domains they they do the, the kind of things or they aim to do the kind of things that we are doing, and um, we all recognize the challenges and the uh, and the kind of achievements that have been made possible by this uh, clus cluster uh, project call. Um, and we are all aiming to do this in the context of the uh, creation of the European Open Science Cloud. These clusters have a regular um, model of uh, exchange of information. Um, more recently, they started to have bi-weekly meetings, so the leaders of the clusters have bi-weekly meetings to discuss all kinds of issues, both practical and, um, and policy related. It's very important maybe not for your daily work, but it's, it's good to, to understand that the kind of cluster that we are is not unique in that respect, that there are four more of them. Um, yeah, getting back to the picture that was already presented by Ivana. We need a model, we need a model to, uh, to shape the future of our collaboration. Uh, and we've chosen to do that with an MOU. Other clusters are doing the same thing, sometimes slightly different, sometimes based on a slightly more uh, committing model, um, almost never fully legally binding. Uh, the um, uh, service level agreements that Ivana already mentioned would be the kind of thing um, that would um, really represent strong commitments between a service provider and a party that wants to, to use it. Um, but we have a list of activities that we have already started to work on and will continue to work on. But in terms of governance, um, the one here on the left uh, is a very important one, namely, apart from this declaration of intentions, we need to have rules of procedure. For example, if we want to be a cluster that is speaking uh, with one voice and that can be uh, an entry point, a contact point for the policy makers in the landscape, we need to be sure about who is representing the cluster. So we need to have a model of who can represent the cluster. Um, that could either be a model of rotating uh, representation or something else. This is still to be developed. So we're not there yet in terms of uh, the governance model. Um, and also, of course, a big question mark is now that the project stops and we don't have funding for a shock per se, um, how do we fund the collaboration and the activities that we want to have on the agenda? Of course, the ERICs and, and especially the landmarks, they have their basic funding. They are not solely dependent on, on project money. They are legal entities that the member countries pay their basic uh, budget. Um, but of course, if you do collaboration, you need meetings, you need maybe uh, some pilot activities for uh, innovation, etc. Some budget may be involved um, and we need to make sure that we obtain that. Currently, there is no uh, call of the type that uh, was the basis for this shock project. So we can't apply for similar funding, but of course we can try to uh, include that agenda for collaboration in other forms of um, uh, uh, project acquisition. So we will work together on uh, European uh, uh, project proposals with, for European funding. So that's also a very high priority to make sure that we have the means to, uh, uh, to work on a, the longer term uh, collaboration. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's, it's also good to, to dive a bit deeper into uh, what it actually is that we're going to sustain or that we'd like to sustain and, and that is building on, on SSH specific challenges and, and achievements that, uh, uh, that, that are uh, on the agenda of this, uh, of this meeting uh, uh, already. So to get back to this, to this point that, that the, for which I quoted uh, our project officer, we need to make sure that um, uh, the, dem the relevance of the kind of work that we are doing is not only demonstrated for, uh, uh, for scholarly projects or, or scientific uh, work, but that we also support the implementation of, of public uh, uh, policies. And, and already we managed to do that in, in a way that uh, was, I think, convincing in many ways, namely the very fast response to the outbreak of, uh, of the COVID pandemic, because all the research infrastructures in, in shock produced uh, overviews of things that they had done or could do uh, to make sure that the, um, the dynamics in uh, the, the societal dynamics of, of the pandemic were, were captured where possible. There were surveys prepared based on the templates for, for surveys. There was uh, work on uh, showing uh, all kinds of, um, uh, how to say that, images in society. There was a, a project by Daria, images in society reflecting uh, the pandemic. Uh, there was a, a collection of uh, parliamentary debates uh, on COVID and made available and continued as a project. So there were all kinds of things that showed that the relevance of the SSH community in the case of such a pandemic for public bodies. There's also a wide coverage uh, uh, of um, uh, activities that align, are aligned with the um, so-called United Nations uh, sus uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, there's a whole list of them. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but um, it's very clear that the social sciences and humanities have a role to play there, and we made that explicit um, in several, uh, at several occasions. Um, and right now, in the context of the project EOSC Future, there is a, 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 a there are several science projects going on with uh, involvement of um, some sort of pilot projects demonstrating uh, how the dots uh, of EOSC. Um, can be connected um, um, by the involvement of SSH research uh, agendas. Another thing that is typical for, for SSH is um, um, the, the fact that the, basically what we are studying is, is societal uh, or social and cultural dynamics. That's, that's the thing that, that binds us. And uh, interoperability at all layers is, is a, a useful instrument to to make that um, um, uh, endeavor stronger. Um, yeah, and, and we've been doing that. Hmm? Uh, we, we, we know how to do that. But it's good to keep in mind that in SSH, we will also have to uh, always have to work with a uh, huge diversity of data types, uh, huge diversity of, of workflows and, and scholarly cultures. Another uh, dimension is the fact that, of another diversity aspect is the fact that we're always encountering issues related to the multilinguality of European society uh, and also the multimodality of the data. It's not just numbers and, and text, but also uh, images, videos, speech and, and, uh, and what have you. Um, then um, there is also the, um, the fact that there's not just collaboration with other clusters in, to, to, uh, to gain insights in multidisciplinarity, but that's also part of our internal agenda. Even within uh, just humanities uh, or just history, or you, you can go uh, at a very deep level, but al almost always there is a form of multidisciplinarity involved, which has to do, of course, with the fact that um, the, uh, the basis for research is often uh, uh, the resources, the data, etc., is, is very diverse. Another element um, is the longitudinal value of SSH data. Um, uh, if you do social surveys, you don't want to throw them away after a year. You want to be able to build up um, uh, 
the data for many, many years to be able to do more thorough comparisons uh, for humanities. Uh, historical comparisons are, are relevant. So um, SSH is typically an area where you don't want to um, uh, dissolve a, a research infrastructure because the data collected and, and the service uh, uh, offer um, uh, is actually calling for uh, eternity rather than uh, stopping the whole endeavor after 10 years because the equipment is, uh, has become old-fashioned. Um, and I think uh, it's also very good to mention that we paved the way for a strong program on how to educate and train uh, the next generation of people working in our domains, which is again uh, a very strong contribution to society at large because the, uh, the digital transformation is ongoing. Uh, maybe the uptake of digital technology in, in SSH is a bit slower than in some other areas, but just bef because of the fact that we can offer training and do this in a harmonized way, we're actually building a very strong labor force uh, for Europe in general, which may be uh, a tremendous and crucial asset to uh, potential for innovation in Europe. It's an abstract story, um, but it's something that we should keep in mind if we have to justify our cause. Um, <coughs> Then uh, I would also like to dive a bit deeper into what our stakeholders, so the people that um, uh, that make sure that we have the means to do our work, that we fit in uh, the model for uh, the research infrastructure ecosystem, that we fit into uh, the, the landscape of EOSC, um, um, that they that they recognize what what we what the needs are um, what the needs are of, of, of the shock cluster but also of the other uh, clusters and the, and the cluster model in general um, because it's see it's very clear that in this quite um, um, so the whole process towards eels uh, is is not a very straightforward process it's it's something surrounded by many many question marks and uncertainties. But it's very clear that if, if EOSC, if the European Open Science Cloud is, is supposed to be supportive of um, uh, the, the scientific system and, and to support uh, scientific development, um, we need to be sure that the scientific agendas play a role. Um, and, and scientific agendas are not built at the top. They also not formed at, at the level of individual researchers or maybe not even individual research groups. There's something in between where that dynamics and the common planning and the, um, and the development of visions uh, is taking shape. And it seems that in, in, uh, in this ecosystem, the clusters with their common issues and uh, the common models uh, are, are very well positioned. Um, so continued recognition of the coordinating role of, of the clusters is a, uh, is a very important element in, in that process. But it's not all always, well, maybe it has changed, but uh, after the, the fact that there is now not a call for the funding of clusters is a signal that, it, that a few years ago that insight was not widespread. Now we see that uh, at several places people do recognize this and, and, and that in, in the longer term there may be other forms of support for the clusters. And one thing that has now um, been understood by many people is that promotion and visibility of the role and the potential uh, for impact of, of research infrastructures uh, should be um, uh, recognized in the way um, the funding models for uh, the Horizon Europe Pillar 2, so the challenges uh, or the mission-driven projects, um, uh, it, how do, uh, the promotion and visibility of our federated service model should be uh, should be reflected. So, if you, they should not leave us out and, and start all over again with the development of services when they are already there. So, as said, we 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 need this structural support and, and funding for the collaboration uh, between the clusters, but also, of course, for uh, the SSH internal initiatives. I think that signal has come through. Um, but we also need models, not, apart from funding, 
models for collaboration and especially if we want to include other infrastructural initiative or data infrastructures beyond the, the typical uh, uh, S3 ones. So we need to align with the now very strong emphasis on national development of research infrastructure or even regional ones. Uh, we need to make sure that the data spaces that are relevant for our domain uh, can be connected to. So there is, a, for example, the European Cultural Heritage Data Space, there is Europeana that you may know, there's the European Language Grid. These are initiatives that somehow should be taken on board in, in, the, in the vision for uh, the SSH open cluster. Um, and then, of course, uh, there is the question of how to integrate um, the, um, uh, in the S3 model the old and the new uh, research infrastructures. Um, we, we, we should not start from uh, uh, reintroducing competition. We, we want to collaborate and, and, and our funders should make sure uh, that they are aware of the fact that uh, uh, there will be a waste on, on investment if, if they put us in, in very competitive, very competitive um, frameworks. Um, and this demands that the national roadmaps, because it's often the national research infrastructure roadmaps that decide which uh, uh, new research infrastructures uh, can, uh, can be initiated, that these no roadmaps should be better aligned. So the policymakers should be aware of uh, the complexity of the landscape and, and help us identify new models uh, that will help us to sustain the collaboration. Um, and of course, um, um, there are all kinds of open science initiative and support structures emerging nowadays with uh, uh, data stewards in uh, all kinds of academic uh, institutes um, and digital competence centers, uh, both locally and, and thematic. And these are the kind of um, support structures that partly overlap with what we would like to offer. So we should at least make sure that they are aware of what, what we can do and then we should find a way of dividing uh, the roles in a smart way. And then I would like to end with, um, with this uh, slide, which is, it's old, it's, it's a few years old. I think it's, uh, I presented it at one of the very first um, uh, sessions where shock was presented to the outside world. It was in, uh, in Helsinki at the RDA meeting. Um, this is showing the structure of uh, uh, the clusters um, uh, in, in the context of the European Open Science Cloud. And of course here the shock cloud is a bit bigger because it needs more uh, text. And I could have even added the dots of the upcoming initiatives. Um, but here I think um, and this, I would like to, s to see this picture as a, um, underlining the, them the thematic strength of EOS for the advancement of science. Uh, and all these clusters uh, need the support of the generic functionality that the European Open Science Cloud will bring. But um, in a way, this, this picture aligns with uh, the story about uh, the importance of strong silos that Case just presented. Um, Without strong clusters, there can't be an EOSC. There can't be an EOSC that will function. Um, and it, mean, it is important that the, the clusters, well, in this case, it's this structure, it could have been something else, but that the intermediate layer at which the scientific dynamics uh, gets shaped is strong, is independent, has a history, has a future, um, and is not, will not necessarily disappear if the whole concept of EOSC would disappear. We have our marketplace. We are able to show to the world what we have on offer. We don't need EOS for that. Uh, it's, it's wonderful that we can collaborate with the other clusters and, uh, and demonstrate the possibility to, to cross all kinds of disciplinary boundaries, that there is uh, interoperability of metadata at all levels, uh, that there is um, a good understanding of how research infrastructures can organize themselves and that that is somewhat predictable if we follow similar models, but we should cherish our history and our future by 
building some independent identity. And this is maybe the biggest challenge for uh, um, the kind of structure that we tried to initiate with this memorandum of understanding and that, and that we hope will be joined by many. Thank you. Thank you, Francisca. Thank you, Ivana. And now I'd like to invite uh, Laura on the stage and she will present a use case, so to say, about uh, sustainability of the marketplace. Laura. So yes, thank you indeed. I would like to present you an example of what it could mean in practice to sustain in ser uh, service. Uh, in, in our case, the SSH open marketplace under the framework that was presented, uh, so this memorandum of understanding. So you heard already yesterday what the SSH open marketplace is. I won't uh, say it again, or maybe just a few words. So it's a discovery portal, it's a catalog, um, and sustainability and, and governance have been at the, at the heart of the platform design. And uh, we really try to also include these dimensions uh, when thinking about uh, how to build it, what it should look like, uh, how future users uh, should interact with it. And um, it will be sustained after the end of the shop project by CESDA, Clarin and Daria. And this is what I would like to uh, explain, what we needed to think about to establish this uh, sustainability uh, plan and to actually implement it, to have it ready uh, once the project uh, will end at, at the end of next month, of this month. Um, so one thing that we've tried to uh, keep in mind, or actually how it works, is so even if we created this service uh, during the project, we actually based the work on previous projects. So maybe some of you already worked in the DASIS, pro in the DASISH project. Uh, some of you might have worked as well in the Partenos project. So this is all the kind of legacy that we have tried to uh, take with ourselves while thinking about and developing the SSH open marketplace. Um, and also because sustainability, um, so beyond this, this projects, what we also try to keep in mind is that there are like several dimensions to take into consideration while thinking about sustainability. So you can see an example of what it means here, we try to think about the data, about the technology, but also about the community and communications and processes, and all of this simultaneously uh, while building it. And um, we were also lucky that we could build on uh, previous experiences and previous projects, especially when it comes to tools registry. And there is this uh, kind of famous uh, quote that we always kept with ourselves, which is a directory paradox that uh, in the digital humanities context, uh, the community is asking or is um, um, support the idea of tool registry, but the model for sustainability that we have found so far, we're actually always relying on one individual PI, really well supported by one individual institution. And this is exactly the kind of thing that we thought the EOSC environment and the shop cluster could provide us an opportunity to overcome this paradox because of the collaborative environments that uh, was possible within the within the shop context. So these are all the kind of things that we try to carry with us while working on the sustainability plan implementation. And how does it look like then? Um, this is somehow the result of the work that was developed by CNRS uh, in our uh, work package. So this is what we call the uh, SSH uh, Open Marketplace Governance kind of scheme. So um, three ERICs will sign a service agreement. Um, we are working on it. It should be done by during this month, let's say, in the months that we have left. So Daria, Clarin, and Cesda are, seen as, are signing what will be um, a binding agreement. So also based on the cost estimation that we've worked on. So basically maintaining this uh, service means uh, investing um, uh, 90,000 uh, uh, euros per year. Uh, so it's a shared um, responsibility for these uh, three ERICs. In terms of investment, we've uh, created a model that uh, allow cash and in-kind contributions to support these costs. <coughs> 
and the service provision is ensured by the Austrian Center uh, for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage and by the Poznan Supercomputing and Networking Center. Um, so this is the kind of first uh, component of the scheme, if you wish. Uh, the second one, um, and probably the central one, is the editorial board that will ensure the day-to-day uh, -day operations of the service. So it means um, that moderators and administrators of the platform uh, will take care of the maintenance, the, uh, will ensure data quality and curation, and there is a lot to do here, as we've heard also in, in uh, other presentations. Um, and there are also people in charge of the community engagement, um, because the third component of, of this scheme is uh, obviously the, the users and the contributors. So we, the, the portal was designed to support community curations and uh, contributors can um, add or enrich the entries that we reference in, in the catalog and we really would like to support um, these contributions by um, closed, uh, let's, by uh, ends on sessions and uh, really um, specific uh, sessions with the contributors to, to support their engagement. So if I enter a, a bit into more details about the editorial board, the members of this editorial board will be appointed by the three ERICs uh, partnering um, to support the marketplace. So the activities of the members of the editorial board will, are, are um, uh, funded, so the, the, their involvement is included in the, in the budget to, to support the, the service. Um, this was an important point, so we wanted to avoid uh, as much as possible vol volunteering uh, involvement for this uh, core um, part of the, of the service, but uh, at the same time we don't want to close it neither, so it's, uh, it will also be um, open for uh, volunteers to, to join the editorial board. Um, this will also be the uh, body in charge of reporting to the ERICs about the um, about the, let's say, performance of the service, so the KPIs uh, thing that we were also discussing yesterday as part of the first session. Um, and the task of this editorial board consists of um, in moderation of the, of the content suggested by the users, uh, curation, uh, if we uh, ingest new data source, it's also this editorial board that will uh, ensure that everything goes as smoothly as possible and community engagement, I already mentioned it. Um, another import important dimension when, um, when it comes to sustainability and uh, governance is uh, EOSC integration. Um, so two dimensions that we can uh, highlight here. The fact that uh, uh, during the shock project we have uh, integrated the EOSC AI uh, to log in into the SSH open marketplace. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than, than this, but uh, let's say that it's here, so if you want to log in in, in, the, in the portal, you, you will uh, have this interface of uh, signing with EOSC and you can rely then on, on your individual identity providers to, to log in. And the second dimension in terms of EOSC integration is the uh, onboarding of the SSH open marketplace into the um, EOSC catalog and, and marketplace, so you can see here the, what, it, what it looks like, the entry in the, in the EOSC catalog. Um, and probably the last thing that I wanted as well to, to mention this morning is that um, the, the marketplace is, can also play a role in sustaining or um, um, in the sustainability of other shock outputs um, because uh, we can offer visibility and uh, better discoverability for some of the outputs that were uh, created within the shock project. So we are already um, referencing the shop key exploitable results <coughs> sorry in the in the portal and you are all invited to improve the records that we have created for your results if you think that uh, they are not um, um, well enough uh, described or that uh, relations or links could be created with other resources that we have in the portal and uh, there are also more uh, synergies that uh, that are possible with the with some specific uh, output, so it's the case, uh, for example, for the training discovery toolkit and the conversion, uh, conversion hub. Um, we could imagine that the marketplace uh, could be used for future curation of these um, outputs and, and then um, um, 
we could envision a kind of a filtered view or subset of the marketplace uh, that, uh, that can be reused for the specific purpose of the conversion hub, so all the uh, resources that are already referenced there or for the, for the toolkit. Um, another example that was uh, also investigated and, and uh, um, propositions were, were made during the in, uh, within the project um, is the possibility to uh, work on f f further integration with other components of the shock infrastructures. And I just put here uh, references to uh, switchboards and virtual collection registry based on some use cases for integration with the, with the marketplace that were developed within the project. We can imagine others. Um, yesterday, multilinguality was also mentioned as a core part of the uh, triple project. That's also something that we can keep in mind because it's one of the weaknesses of the of the SSH open marketplace at this stage. So there are uh, other uh, dimensions that we can continue to work on for the for the future of the of the marketplace itself. And that's all I wanted to highlight. I think. So thank you. Um, we are a little bit running out of time, but we still have some time for, for question. And can I ask the speakers to, to join uh, on stage? Uh, so it will be more easier to, to answer the questions. Um, first of all, are there any online questions from the online participants? No. Uh, can I then ask the participants in the room if there are any questions? Yeah, I see a hand raised. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentations. Very interesting. I have a question with respect to how you see the rep representativity of uh, the future cluster collaboration. Uh, one is that evidently um, the things that have been um, how do you say, collaborated on within shock, are limited, limited with respect to all the things that are happening in, in um, let's say, research infrastructure building. And now it's the case that the clusters are seen as the ideal representants of the communities in, for instance, collaborations, uh, the EOSC uh, um, projects. So, if let's say a project like EOS Future goes to the cluster and asks what are you doing in AI? There is no AI policy within uh, the SSH as a cluster. You have, they have to go to the individual um, research infrastructures to get uh, um, real information. So how do you, and, and this is not the same over all the clusters, right? So for instance in, what is it, and Free Fair, they might have an AI policy. So this, this differs over all the clusters. So how to handle this? And also, um, how will it be when um, there is a new project uh, that started? Uh, will the cluster uh, take part or will the cluster coordinate participation of the research infrastructures in such projects? Or is this still left to the discretion of the individual research infrastructures? Thanks, uh, Dan. I think clear are two questions, but maybe the qu overall question is, is who is initiating those types of questions? It's Franci about mandate and representativity. Yeah, yeah. Francisco? Um, I, I'll try to answer the first question uh, not in a too abstract way. Um, but with the example of AI, uh, uh, I think the answer can <laughs> can be uh, short and simple. Um, some topics uh, will not have a strictly thematic angle. Uh, of course, AI may be slightly different in, uh, in each cluster, but I would in the end uh, expect that um, either uh, the EOSC uh, framework uh, or another generic service provider would help out there with models that could be adopted with best practices, etc. So uh, for generic uh, functionality, 
I think it's not the cluster um, that needs to provide the answer. They may need to consult um, other parties, but um, I don't think there's a real issue there. I would, the, the, the role of the cluster and, uh, and the expertise of the cluster and the identity of the cluster is sitting in the, in the thematic aspects, the things that are typical for SSH in our case. Um. I'll, I'll try to answer the second one. If there is a proposal to, to, uh, to the cluster to, to be involved in one of the future calls, uh, which actually is being discussed, there are some calls of interest, as, as you probably know, uh, at least in the draft program uh, that's been um, shared around randomly. Uh, but since uh, the, the final version is expected in June, um, I, I personally don't think it will change a lot. So at the moment, there are several possibilities for clusters, so all five, to be uh, involved in different combinations uh, in the upcoming calls during 23 and 24. Um, now, how to deal with that uh, when shock should be involved? You know that in projects, um, um, to be involved, you have to be a legal entity. And we had sort of an example of already with EOSC Future, uh, where, where the, the demand to, for shock to be included uh, came to the first year to the strategic board. And then uh, based on availability and capacity, um, finally uh, it was SESDA, Clarin and Daria ending up uh, being involved with other institutions in the future. Now, that is a bit specific project. It is the second phase of EOSC. Um, which um, sort of made the participation um, very particular um, to ERICS, to, to, to big organizations, um, uh, international organizations, research infrastructures in particular, uh, which kind of limited um, the entry level for, for, for others, which can be debated, has its pros and cons, um, and I completely agree with any of the comments that could arise on that. Uh, however, I, I do expect that uh, in the um, rules of procedure, we also define how to, um, how to um, organize uh, distribution of information channels within, within this community and make it very transparent um, on, the, on, on participation in such, such, uh, uh, regarding such opportunities. So it's all about communication channels. It's all about transparency as, as far as at least I'm concerned, but I, I deeply believe that's, uh, that's uh, very close to hearts to, to everybody entering the MOU and the founding members. Um, uh, I know how we do it with SESDA. If we have um, uh, an opportunity to participate, we share it with our service providers. Um, and what they need to do is actually to raise hand, bearing in mind that they have the capacity, knowledge and expertise uh, to be, to be um, a functional part of the project. It doesn't always function perfectly, but um, it is as transparent as, as possible. So there are models to do it, yeah. Okay, thank I hope you. this trend, yeah. yeah. Thank you, any other questions from the audience? Yep, Sally. Thanks very much, oops, sorry. Thanks very much. Um, I would like to go back to two of the presentations. So the first presentation um, related to these um, specific data communities uh, that you were talking about. And I wonder what is the role of these data communities going forward? So could new data communities come along um, and join uh, Shock, Or at the data community level, could there be cross um, cluster opportunities for collaboration. So I very much like the metaphor of the atomium. So I wondered if, if somebody would like to respond to the sort of the, the ongoing inclusion of data communities within the clusters. Um, new data communities will come along. That's if we look at the history of science and, and uh, the, particularly over the 20th and, and the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, we see that uh, there are continuous reconfigurations, if you want to call it that way, of disciplines, of thematic interests, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, so new uh, research communities, new data communities will come along. Uh, I think it's imperative uh, that uh, structures such as SHOCK and EOSC are open to them, and not only look at it from the, well, call it a top-down 
uh, perspective, uh, but are open to newly emerging uh, uh, data communities. There is, of course, a question of which of those are viable enough to get support and which not. There, is, there, there will be a competitive element in that, but I think it's, it's really important uh, that uh, opportunities will be given uh, in, in the form of support and facilitation for uh, 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 grassroots up evolving uh, new data communities. And they will, to some extent, uh, be the, the yeast, if you want to call it that way, that will help uh, to make whatever is uh, constructed at a higher level edible. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more. Actually, we don't have time. But Astrid, Astrid. Oh, you want to say something? Sorry, maybe Ivana. To, maybe to follow up on this. Um, it was part of uh, discussions yesterday, and, and it's exactly what, what, uh, what Case was saying. Um, so data communities should and will be included. Um, they are necessary um, in a way. Uh, yesterday, uh, you know, an over past few uh, months and, and events, um, it was um, very, you know, this hardly discussed that, that, that how, what is the role of scientists, what is the role of researchers, how we, how we reach them, how much they should know about um, functioning of infrastructures, functioning of EOSC. Um, and at, at one point, um, the, the, the common understanding that was prevailing, but at that point was researchers shouldn't care what is behind or what, what, what are the layers of EOSC. They just want added value, which means more data, uh, cross-discipline data, computational services, so on and so forth, tools um, that they can use that will enhance uh, and broaden uh, their topics of research and, and hence help us all in solving, solving challenges uh, of today's society. You know, that's like the, the floscula, you know, that, that we all have, but it is very true and it is in our missions. So that was the prevailing opinion at one point. However, uh, yesterday, um, during discussions, it turned out that we built something up to a point. We have some tools and services, but how to upgrade them. And I think it was, it was Giovanni Lamana from, from Escape, he's somewhere here, um, saying, uh, we need them to tell us how to finish our products. That, do they really serve them as they should? So researchers should know not maybe every researcher, but they should know. And having thematic communities, which are basically groups of researchers gathered with specific expertise, gathered over a certain topic, um, usually very passionate about it, and, and they want to advance their community, their group, they want to use the tools that are at hand, they're a bit more involved uh, behind the scenes. Um, it really makes sense to actually um, use them is, is, is not a nice word, but that's it, collaborate with them closely to actually help us shape whatever we are doing because we exist as re research infrastructures because of researchers. That's our ultimate point of existence. So it, it makes very much sense to have data communities because that's also, you know, a hand of arm length uh, to, to the community itself. So. Yeah. Maybe to add to this, I already mentioned it in my slides, but I do think, as far as I can kind of see what's happening in, in the various countries, but you see that the investment in national infrastructures and, and the, the digital transformation leads to new support nodes in, uh, in the academic context in which most researchers work. Uh, sometimes they're called digital competence centers. I'm not sure if that's the only term for it, but these are also the parties uh, that we need to collaborate with and to find uh, a balanced division of labor and, and, and they too can indicate uh, the relevance uh, of certain data communities and vice versa. So I think that will be an element in the landscape that, will, that may change our, our way of working as well. Thank you, speakers. Uh, thank you all for, for this morning's session. Um, I think other questions need to be followed up <laughs> during the coffee because we all already stolen 10 minutes of your time, of your coffee time. And I don't want to hold up the next session. Um, one more housekeeping uh, note. Um, I, can I ask you to please all 
uh, sign the attendee list for the second day as well as we need it for accounting purposes. Um, but for now, I want to thank you all and thank the speakers again uh, for this session and see you after. <laughs>